The first lesson is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Paul is writing this letter while he is under house arrest in Rome for preaching about Christ. He reminds the Ephesians that he has been assigned the special work of preaching the good news to the Gentiles. God's plan is to have both Jews and Gentiles comprise the body of the church as equals. It is Paul's privilege to perform this special role. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant, according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter the second chapter, verses one through twelve. Reads as such. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. Now entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, after opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ah. Well, that too, but we're focusing on the Christmas part right now. Today is the last day of Christmas, 12 days of Christmas. Somewhere we should have 12 drummers drumming, I think. I don't know where they get the 12 days of Christmas, but it's in the church calendar. I suspect the 12 days are associated with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples of Christ. But they, we have these 12 days where we continue to remember the Christ child. Tomorrow is Epiphany. And this is the day that we remember the story I just read, the coming of the wise men, the coming of the magi, another term for them, when they come and see the baby Jesus. And when you think of an epiphany, I think most, usually what we think of is when the, suddenly we get this great revelation. You know, the light bulb goes off, turns on over your head, and all of a sudden you see clearly what previously had been very cloudy and mysterious and suddenly you know you're, you're able to reinterpret the past on how it looks now and you, you have new directions on, on the ways that you need to go. I would say that the passage we read from Ephesians a little earlier where it talks about the mystery of Christ that Christ has come so that, that the Gentiles might also be included, welcomed into the family of God. That, that all that's been taking place in the Old Testament wasn't just for the Jews, but it's preparing the way for God including everyone. Everyone is welcomed. And you could call this an epiphany. An epiphany of, of now the light that goes off, the mystery has been uh, identified and solved, and we know that in Christ everyone is welcomed. And we see this to some degree in, in the Matthew passage with the coming of the Magi. Here we have non-Jews coming to see the new king, the king of the Jews that was, had been born. Now, there are lots that we, we don't know or we have um, conclusions we've drawn that are not true or are not correct, at least according to the text, of who these were. 
I call them magi because that's the Greek word. And we get the root word, the root word is for magician or magic. And they were probably from Persia, which is modern-day Iran. They, um, they, they were probably kind of a mixture between astronomers and astrologists. In other words, they would, they would study the stars and, uh, and they would see what they could learn from that. They might have been priests and or scholars. We tend to think that there were three of them, but we're given no number in the text. Um, we get the three because of the three gifts. But they were traveling, if they came from Persia, they were traveling a great distance to get to Bethlehem, eventually Bethlehem, where they would see Jesus. And it's highly unlikely that three people would make that trip alone. It's about a 1,000 miles. It's about like us traveling from here on foot or riding a camel to Orlando, Florida. That's quite a distance. It would have taken probably, a round trip would probably take them a year. And here they are making that journey, and probably, like I said, more than just three, probably a whole caravan. But what prompted them to make this journey? Oh, we say the star, they saw the star, and they started to follow that star where it led. But how did they know that this star had specific meaning, significance? Well, they they knew that a new king had been born, a king of the Jews. I have to imagine that there were kings being born all around the place, but we have no stories of people traveling great distances to pay homage to, to those kings. Here's my theory. Some 500 years or so before this, Babylon conquered Jerusalem. And they took some of the best and the brightest out of Jerusalem and took them back to Babylon. And we know uh, about Daniel. He was one of the ones that was taken and his three friends. And we know their story because we have a book of the Bible called Daniel. And (coughs) also in that book are many prophecies. Now, talking about the newborn king and, and Bethlehem and all that, that's not one of the ones that's in there. But I don't think it's unreasonable to think that perhaps Daniel or, or one of his companions or maybe even some Jew, Jewish prophet that came later uh, wrote down the significance of the star in the sky and that this newborn king would do something great. And so they pack up and they make this long journey. Now in the text, there's all kinds of activity going on in these 12 verses. There's, there's this journey being made. There's uh, meetings being arranged, uh, some of them uh, in secret. There's the biblical prophecy being examined. Where was the Messiah to be born? Uh, there was deceit, and, and there was uh, uh, thwarting that deceit, and there was uh, responses of emotion, of, uh, of worship and fear. All of this is involved in the story. I, I, I sometimes wonder, uh, what, what, what all is going on on that journey? You know, if it... If it's going to take them supposedly about six months to get there, what do they talk about around the campfire at night? You know, do they are they talking about this prophecy, what this king might look like? Are there days when they're discouraged and they're thinking, why are we doing this? Let's turn around and go home. All these questions. And then what obstacles are they facing, you know, in this long journey? Are there storms? Is there sickness? 
What about uh, finding food and water? Uh, is that readily available, or are there some days when they're wondering, oh, where are we going to find it? Do they get lost? Um, are there thieves or wild animals that they have to deal with? And then after they get there and they see Jesus and they start heading back, are they asking, was it worth it? Was this long journey, the gifts that we gave, is it worth it? We're on a faith journey. Perhaps not a thousand mile journey on foot or camelback to see Jesus, but we're on a faith journey to also follow Jesus. And there are often curves in the road and unseen obstacles that we face that we weren't expecting that maybe cause us to ask ourselves is it worth it is what is following this Jesus is it really worth the effort and that's why we need to do this journey together so that we can encourage one another when we have those days of encouragement, when we experience those obstacles uh, in the road, <clears throat> so that we can encourage one another and build one another up, so that we grow in our faith, but also together we're able to put our faith into practice and do the work that God is calling us to do. I hope maybe this is the lesson, one of the lessons we get from this story. But there's another lesson I want us to look at. These magi go into Jerusalem thinking this is where the, the, uh, the newborn king was born because this is the capital of the Jews. Surely this is where the king was and they get there and it's not. People aren't excited about a newborn king. Nobody knows anything about it. And so the Magi enlightened the people. Hey, we've been following this star for a long time. This is a newborn king, a new Messiah, a new hope. And yet, the response of the people in Jerusalem is of fear, not of joy, excitement, but fear, what's Herod going to do? How is Herod going to respond? And, and if we'd read on past the story we read today, we would know that Herod goes on to kill the baby boys in Bethlehem. The story does not tell us that anyone from Jerusalem followed the Magi to Bethlehem. They didn't go. Here, they, they're being told, here's great news. Newborn king, the one you've been expecting. And no one follows. It's not like they're being asked to do a, a thousand mile journey. It's probably more like a five mile journey. It's a, a journey you can, you can make a round trip in one day. But no one goes. sat on the sidelines and they missed a wonderful opportunity. We're starting a new year now. I believe God wants to do some new and exciting things here in our church. And I think the question is, are you going to get involved? Or are you going to sit on the sidelines? Are you going to miss out on a wonderful opportunity because of fear? So often we talk about the things we can't do as opposed to asking what can we do and asking where might God be leading us? And if God is leading us, who is God going to be raising up among us to do this wonderful work? 
So I leave you with this thought. Are you going to be on the sidelines? Or are you going to take advantage of the opportunities that are before us? The Magi made the trip, the journey. And I suspect when it was all said and done, they said it was worth it. And they were excited about it. May we respond in the same way as we move forward as a church. Amen.